What's up? I'm B, and whether you are watching this on YouTube or you are listening to the podcast, I hope you are having an amazing day. Today, we're going to be talking about Carissa Collins, and I have never spoken about her on my channel before, but I've gotten a few uh, comments in my comments section talking about her and asking me to take a look at her internet presence. So I've been dipping my toes into her story, kind of seeing what's going on within the things that she posts and the things that she talks about. And recently she and her husband did a video on Instagram and it got a lot of attention for some pretty negative reasons. And so I was finally like, all right, let's do this. Let's talk about Carissa Collins, her husband, Mandre, and her Instagram, which is the Collins kids, which is part of why she does get so much social media attention. Essentially, Carissa and her husband, um, she's really like the face of this internet presence. Obviously, her husband's there. He's involved. He's in the posts that she posts, but she runs the Instagram. And so while they're both part of this, it's easier for me to just say Carissa because it seems like she's the driving force of what's posted on the internet, okay? Okay. So Carissa and her family are very religious. They do not believe in birth control of any kind, and they have 10 children. And so because they have such a large family and they're so vocal about being devoutly religious, they ruffle some feathers. And for me, when I was first introduced to the Collins Kids Instagram, and this has nothing to do with the the children from my end. It's just that's the name of the Instagram. I will not be talking about the kids unless it's in relation to something that comes up in the video that we're about to watch. But you see somebody who is really religious, who's, you know, a homemaker, who wants to homeschool, who has a bunch of kids. And I think it's really easy to make snap judgments, but I was really trying to not do that because I'm like, hey, if that's what makes them happy, you know, fine, good for them. But then the more I looked into it, the more problems I started seeing pop up. And so I just, I want to have a conversation about some of those things. So just a little bit of background. Carissa does run the Instagram page, The Collins Kids. It has 796,000 followers. And on that page, she posts about her family, her children, her pregnancies, her views on marriage and what it looks like to be a good wife and how people should act in her opinion. And she also has five, just over 5,000 subscribers on YouTube, which was kind of surprising to me. But then I looked at the content on there and it seems like she doesn't really post as much on there. Like she doesn't, she's not as active on YouTube as she is on Instagram. So I guess it makes sense, but I would just assume with 796,000 followers on Instagram, she would have more on YouTube, but that's beside the point. She also uh, runs a clothing boutique. She is a part of Modare, which is an MLM, and she does photography. Her husband, Mandre, works in finance currently, but he also runs a home church and an axe throwing business and a woodworking business. And kind of a, an interesting fact, which explains how they know Shaq, because they do know Shaq, and Shaq bought them a new like 15 passenger van not too long ago, which was big, exciting news. He used to be a member of the New York Nationals, which is a basketball team affiliated with the Harlem Globetrotters. And so he did travel around playing professional basketball, which I think is just kind of cool. So together they have 10 children and they range from the ages two months to 13 years and just something from her uh, Facebook. This is a little bit Old, I can tell because she lists all of her children in it and I'm not going to read their names like I said unless there's something I'm saying specifically related to something she has done regarding her children like I I'm not here to bring children into anything right so anyway like I said this Facebook about me section is a little bit outdated because she mentions that their youngest is on the way but that youngest child has now been born and so in it she says hi my name is Carissa and I am married to Mandre we have been married for 15 years. We are a Bible-believing, Christ-following with no denomination. We pastor a home church and run men's and women's small groups. I have an online boutique and do photography. Hubs is in finance and trains children in basketball. We are so blessed to have nine, soon to be 10, beautiful babies. And then she lists them out. 
and list their ages. So based on what we've gone over so far, it's pretty clear that a, a big driving force behind Carissa's large social media following is the fact that she has 10 children and she makes a lot of her social media revolve around those children. And it ties into their religious beliefs, them having that many kids, because one, they don't believe that you deny your spouse, more specifically, the woman should not deny the husband, um, or the woman should not deny the man sex ever. And they do not believe in birth control. And something kind of interesting to me was I was looking at a few of her videos from a few years ago, just trying to get an idea of who she was back then, like how things kind of evolved over time. And I could be completely wrong because I've not watched every single one of her videos or read every single one of her posts. You know, I'm still fairly new to um, her personality and like the nuances of the things that she says. But in one video from October of 2020, she was addressing some things that had been said about her on social media. And in that video, my perception of her was somebody was that she was just somebody who was like, this is what I believe in. This is what I do. And, you know, th this is just like how I feel about things. And it didn't seem like she was saying things from a point of this is what's right and you have to do it. This is just how I feel. That was kind of the vibe. Um, and in that video, she had mentioned that the Lord had convicted her about using birth control and that she should not use birth control, hormonal, like, this is so graphic. Um, leave a like in case this gets demonetized to show YouTube that the video is still valuable so they shouldn't just not send it to any subscribers because uh, sometimes they do that. But, you know, you shouldn't pull out. You shouldn't use condoms. You shouldn't use any sort of birth control. Nothing like that. But in that video, she said, that's just my conviction. Like, I'm not saying anything about you or what you do because I don't know you. But then we fast forward to April 2nd of this year, and this is a caption that she posted on Instagram. It says, abstinence in marriage. Yesterday, as I was reading the Bible, I got a revelation that might offend many, but I have to share it. As I seek God's heart on family and children, he keeps bringing me to more and more truth. You all know I don't agree with prevention in any form, just trust in God. But if a family doesn't want children, I used to say your only option is abstinence. But the Holy Spirit convicted me on that yesterday. We shouldn't be abstinent in marriage in order to prevent God's greatest blessings. We all know sex before marriage is sin and abstinence is blessed before marriage. But the Bible says to be abstinent in marriage only for a time of unified fasting and prayer, not in order to prevent children. It also says that a wife shouldn't deny her husband. I am very against pullout and masturbation. This leaves us with one option, trusting God, taking nothing into our hands and enjoying the spouse of our youth. It's this simple. Freedom to enjoy your childbearing years. They're fleeting, they're limited, temporary, and blessed, and honor. The enemy has a goal, to get you to stop procreating. That's one of his ways of stopping God. His goal is to get us to hate the way God created us. Simply put, God created us to birth his children, to have fruitful wombs, and we live in a generation that hates it. That celebrates closing it. Sorry, the punctuation is all over the place in here, so I'm trying my best to read this out smoothly. Oh, gosh. That celebrates closing it. We must fight against this desire of our flesh. Remember, sin is appealing. It often feels peaceful and right, but our flesh will always fight our spirit. We must recognize the enemy and his schemes. He prowls around and deceives. He is subtle. We must be on guard against this mindset to reject God's ways and blessings, to rationalize our way out of his will. We have been conditioned by a society that celebrates evil to believe children are a hindrance to our ability to grow financially, spiritually, emotionally, and physically. And the enemy knows that's a lie. The opposite is actually true. I truly believe now abstinence in marriage is sin, just like birth control, tubules, pull-out, and vasectomies. It's an attempt to prevent God's will. It's operating outside of faith, and the Bible says anything not done in faith is sin. So we go from before her being like, I'm not on birth control. I've been convicted in that. That's me. I'm not talking about you. I don't know you to this, to like birth control is sin vasectomies are sin and that's a conviction and that's truth and this is true for everybody so it's just very interesting to see the the difference between those two sentiments only two years apart I'm sure she did back then have that thought of like 
I think this is true for everybody, but you know, I'm just saying it's for me, but it's, but she didn't want to come off that way maybe. And so now she's gotten more bold and more opinionated. And I'm sure part of that is getting negative social media attention. I do think that when you post things on the internet and you do get positive responses, but you also get a lot of negative responses and a lot of people uh, condemning what you're doing. Sometimes it can be difficult to differentiate between like hate and constructive criticism or concern. And so at some point, if you are regularly getting some negative feedback, you can just be like, well, forget it. Like, I'm just going to say what I want to say. And that's what it's going to be. And that can be kind of Uh, revealing to who a person truly is when they start to stop caring about how they come off to others. Like if they're just like, screw it, I'm going to be me, I'm going to say what I want. And you can see like how they truly feel. You're like, oh, this is probably just how you've always been. But before you were a little bit more restrained because you knew how it would be perceived and now you just don't care. So like, that's just me. That's my perception of this situation. I think it's interesting. I could be totally wrong, but that's how I see it. So now that we've got some basics covered, we are going to watch a video that Carissa posted to Instagram. And the reason I wanted to watch this and do like a real time reaction was because I had seen some comments and some rumblings on the internet that in this they talk about how she thought he had gotten a vasectomy. Carissa thought Mandre had gotten one and it turns out he hadn't. And so I don't know the details of it. I don't know, like, did he lie? How did she find out? What's going on? And so that's why I want to watch this with you. And before we start the video, we are going to do win for the week. Let me know in the comment section down below something good that happened to you, something that made you happy, something that made you grateful, whatever it is that happened in the past week that you consider a win so we can celebrate together. My win for the week is probably that. Ooh, I tried at home gel polish. I got this kit because usually I like to do uh, like glue-ons at home, but I wanted to take a little bit of a break from them. Um, Just I've been doing them pretty consistently for a few years now. And so I'm like, I wonder if I could do an at home gel polish because regular nail polish always chips. It's a pain. It takes forever to dry. Anyway, I got this kit and I painted these last Friday. Look at that. They're still here. No chips. It's been over a week. No chips. That's super exciting. I can do gel polish at home. So that is my win. And I cannot wait to hear yours in the comment section down below. Everybody is always asking about my husband's stance. And so doing an interview of my husband, this is my husband, Mandre. And so I'm going to ask you some questions regarding trusting God with your family size. So just a quick recap of our past. When we got married, we did not have a plan to trust God with our family size. We'd never heard of that. Um, We had a five-year plan uh, to wait five years before we started having kids. I personally didn't really want kids that much. I just wanted a career. I think you wanted three kids, Mm -hmm. maybe, but we were going to wait five years. Um, So what made us start trusting God with our family size? We were at church one time, and the sermon was about trust and what it looks like to trust God. And we both left church that day and said, we trust God in every area except having children. And so we left on the same page. Um, Fast forward three babies after that. So we ended up having three babies in like four years. And then... Oh my goodness. Okay. Three babies in four years is a lot. I mean, obviously she has 10 kids. That is a lot. And I do know that they have experienced pregnancy loss, which is awful and just terrible and I read some of the like how things unfolded from her perspective in some of her Instagram captions and it just sounds like a a traumatic thing honestly for her body to go through and so I have so much sympathy for that but hearing like three kids in four years wow that is a lot now as far as this conversation about trusting God with your family size goes I think it is good to give some a biblical context to why they are hung up on this point or why this is such a large factor of their faith and their internet presence. They're not the only religious influencers or public figures who 
follow this line of thinking. We do see it a lot in families like the Duggars and um, the Plath from Welcome to Plathville. So they're certainly not the first people to bring it up, but they are part of this conversation. And it is kind of like based on two concepts in the Bible, essentially. There is a chapter in Psalms where they talk about how um, it's, it's a blessing to have your quiver full meaning like to have a lot of children and that's just like a short verse in the bible i can find it and read it to you it's psalms 127 verse 3 and it says children are a gift from the lord they are a reward from him children born to a young man are like arrows in a warrior's hands how joyful is the man whose quiver is full of them he will not be put to shame when he confronts his accusers at the city gates so obviously that's the verse that is kind of the the stamp of the quiverful movement, I guess. And then when we hear the phrase be fruitful and multiply, we do hear that in Genesis, in the creation story, when God creates uh, human life, he says to be fruitful and multiply in order to populate the earth. And then the second instance that we see of it is after the story of the great flood. I These stories are like complex and intricate, but I'm not trying to like go fully into it. I'm just trying to give context for people who aren't super familiar with the Bible. Uh, The story of the great flood, God sees that mankind is evil except for Noah and his family. And so he tells Noah that he's going to uh, send a great flood. So you need to build this ark, get your family on it, get two of each kind of animals. So that way when this flood comes and I destroy mankind and the flood is over, there's, there's life that can spring forth from you. And so then he tells Noah and his family to be fruitful and multiply. So again, it's interesting to me because, like I said, these verses are so much more complex than this quick little overview I'm doing. But broad level of both of those verses, it's for the purpose of populating the earth because there's nobody there. <laughs> it's because God wants humans on earth. And right now they're there's not many of them. They're in limited supply. So he's telling them to be fruitful and multiply for a specific purpose of actually having people on the earth. Because in both of those instances, you know, in the creation story, it's Adam and Eve. And in the story of Noah, it's Noah and his family. Anyway, all that's to say there are plenty of Christians, even some who are more on the conservative end or the evangelical side who do not subscribe to this idea that any sort of preventative birth control is a sin. But for those who do, that's kind of where those concepts come from. And again, from a theology standpoint, I don't want to seem dismissive of anyone's beliefs or approach to their own family planning. I think people are free to do that as they please. So I don't want it to sound like I'm just like, nah, it's just this little thing. But I'm just trying to give kind of a high level overview of why this conversation takes place and and why this theology sort of where it stems from basically and we came to a disagreement um i got really sick and he got stressed out and had a bunch of fears about continuing to have more children and so our biggest fight was if we were gonna have more kids or not our biggest fight was are we gonna trust god in that area um finally i gave it to god i stopped bringing it up I stopped fighting with him and I said, okay, God, he's yours. Um, Change his heart or change my heart. And then one day, just randomly after our seventh child, which I didn't, I thought he got vasectomies. Uh, He told, he had told me at one time he was getting a vasectomy. I thought he did that, um, but I kept getting pregnant. So anyway, after our seventh child, somebody asked us, what are you going to have more? Okay, yeah, so he straight up told her he was going to get one. She thought he had one and just, like, assumed that it had failed. That's such a betrayal. Like, telling somebody that I have, I'm I'm getting a vasectomy and then not going through with it and not telling them that you did not go through with it and then having unprotected sex with them, that would shake my trust in that person irreparably. Like, I would not ever be able to trust a person who did that. He said, we're just going to trust God. And I was like, Wait, no, I have to ask you questions. You I'm giving the them, point? no, I'm giving them a recap of, of why, of like where we have been. So um, he said he was trusting God and I have no idea. 
I want him to tell us, I have no idea when he changed his mind, why he changed his mind, what spurred his heart. He just randomly said, yeah, we trust God. Okay, so I'm going to ask you, the first question I'm going to ask you is the question you get every day. Mm. Are you going to have more children? I didn't get that question yesterday. Everybody but, asked you that question. But, uh, okay. but answer the, that. the answer is, is simple for me. It's I'll have as many as God wants to give me. Um, and, and I always tell people that if he tells you first, make sure you tell me. That's it. Okay. Um, my next question. What changed your mind and solidified your trust in God in this area? Well, I think it was, uh, you know, I go back to you handing me a book, right? Um, at the point to where we had three or four kids and they were coming pretty quickly, uh, which is kind of, one yeah. of the things that was really starting to change my mind and, and even my heart in this area about really trusting God, um, because the situation started to kind of, um, uh, it didn't, it didn't necessarily look as though it was lending itself to something that was fitting to my, my job, my wife's health, um, those kind of things. Cause the babies were just coming, um, back to back. And, um, I, I remember, I think it was the third or fourth baby. Um, when you had told me that, Hey, um, here's a book, right? Um, read this book, um, before you even think about trying to do a vasectomy and just tell me what you think. Right. Um, and, and what I can appreciate about that is that you weren't necessarily this forceful about it. Um, you were, you were more so just say, hey, read this book. It's kind of informational. And, and I read the first couple of verses of this book and, and quite frankly, I wasn't interested um, simply because for me, it was a lot of man-made, um, uh, opinions, um, if you will. And, and so for me, it, I don't need man's influence to change my heart, um, in this area because I'm a man and I was already influenced in this area. But the main thing is that I needed to just simply be quiet and be still and hear from God in this area. And so, um, just time kind of went on. I never read that book. And I just prayed about it um, to say, God, what is, I want your heart in this. And, and I know that my wife's health may not look the best right now. And, and um, the kids are coming quickly. We want to make sure that there's still provision for it. And um, it was just kind of this, this stillness um, in my life to where God began to really speak to me and say, every kid that I give you, I'll provide for them. Uh, and two, your wife's health, I'll take care of her um, as long as she stays connected to me. And so those two things really kind of helped me. Um, and just hearing from God is so much better than reading a book or anything else. And so we were out in public and I hadn't even talked to my wife about the decision yet uh, in terms of like being completely solidified on just trusting God. Um, we were out in public one day and somebody asked us, um, how many more kids are you guys going to have? And Carissa didn't answer. And she just, you just kind of looked at me. Um, waiting on an answer from me. And I, I, re I remember very vividly just looking this lady in the eyes and I said, man, we're going to have as many as God's going to give us. And um, Carissa kind of just lost it in that moment. And there was tears rolling um, because again, we weren't, we, I never came back around and, and talked to her about where my heart was. And, but honestly, I, I wouldn't have it any other way um, because it, it, it was very clear to me that this was a, this is a guy thing. Uh, he made it very clear to me that trusting him is the way to go. There's really no other way or there is another way, but it's not his way. Um, and so that's kind of, that's kind of my answer. I know it's long, but. So side note, the book. Okay. So while I can sincerely respect someone taking something that they're disagreeing with in their marriage to God and just saying, you know, either change her heart or change mine you know, I, I want to do what your will is. While I completely, sincerely do respect that approach, I want to give a snippet of something that happened to Carissa. Because when they talk about Carissa having health struggles, they're no joke. I'm going to read a few parts of her story as posted on Instagram just so you can get kind of an idea of what they're referring to when they say, like, I was, con when Mandre says, I was concerned about her health. So at this point that Chris is talking about, like, she's sharing a story from, they had two children. 
And she says, when our son was seven months old, I conceived again. We were still being intimate and trusting God to give in his time. I was working and our children were going to daycare. I had a desire to stay home, but didn't financially have the means. I also started to have health issues. My pregnancy again was hard. We gave birth to another girl. Our hearts exploded yet again, and my health began to decline. I started to black out daily. One time I had a car accident after blacking out. I would lose my sight when shopping in the store. Sometimes I fell over as I walked. They discovered my health decline due to the birth control, Yaz, that I was taking four years ago when we got married. And there were many lawsuits going on at the time for this birth control. They also found a hole in my heart and did heart surgery to close the hole. Once they went in to do the surgery, they no longer could see the hole, so I continued to get test after test after test. Eventually, they concluded that I had multiple sclerosis. The doctor told me to stop having children, that I was being unwise, that I would die if I had more. My husband was struggling with either trusting God or the doctor's advice. He went to pastor after pastor asking for advice, and they all told him to get a vasectomy and stop having children. They said that my health was more important. And, and I'm not going to comment on what she may or may not have had going on. I'm just telling you specifically from her words what she's saying went on with her health. But to me, it's terrifying to me that you would have children and you would have people saying, like, if you keep doing this, if you keep going at the rate that you're going, it could have dire health consequences. And you having children, being a mom, having those kids that depend on you, would not heed that, would not take that into consideration. Like to me, I just, I respect her, her belief and her right to do as she chooses with her own body. But that would be something really hard to reckon with. I feel like if, even if you're saying like, I feel like God wants us to have as many kids as possible. You also have to consider being there for the children that you've already created. They said that my health was more important. But God kept telling me to trust him. We fought constantly about this, day and night. He didn't want to be intimate because he was afraid I would get pregnant again. So after I gave birth, I decided to go on birth control rather than the permanent decision of him getting a vasectomy. I ended up taking birth control for one week. Every day I put that pill in my mouth, I felt immediate conviction. I knew I was in sin. I knew I was choosing my will over God's. I knew that anything not done in faith is sin, as the Bible instructs us. I sat my husband down and told him that I could no longer sin. If he wanted to stop the ability of children or prevent them, that he would have to get a vasectomy and answer to God for himself, but I could not partake in the sin of prevention. So there's multiple parts to this story. They go on to have a few more kids, and this is the last part I'll read you before we get back into their video. But I just, I had, like, I had to be like, This is what they're talking about when they say medical issues. So anyway, and at this point in the story, they've had a few more children. And she says, my husband and I still fought constantly about if we should prevent. No longer based on my health, but on how quickly we were having children. His biggest concern was if we would have enough time with the children. So many doubts rushed in in his mind. And everywhere we went, we were met with the ugliness and comments that we had our hands full and needed to stop. People even asked us if we had heard of birth control and that I needed to close my legs. I then got pregnant very quickly again. I think my baby was two months. I went to my first sauna and there was no heartbeat and no baby present, but a big empty sack. It was called a blighted ovum. I had never heard of it. My doctor was relieved and excited that I would miscarry because she didn't like how quickly I was getting pregnant. I got second opinions and prayed daily that God would just put a baby inside my womb. Around 15 weeks pregnant with no baby but a fully developing sac, my body went into a miscarriage. I refused the DNC and just allowed my body to do what it wanted. I ended up bleeding out, being rushed to the ER, and almost dying. I can remember going blind in the ER and feeling my body in fire. I was terrified to die, something I never thought I would feel. I thought I would know for sure that I was set for eternity with God, but in that moment, I was scared and had no idea where I was going. I was rushed to a DNC and woke up angry with God. I spent the next month angry that I almost died. Because you ignored medical advice? You were were angry with God because you ignored medical advice and you almost died. Mm, mm mm-mm, that I almost died, had to have two blood transfusions and no baby, and I suffered every pregnancy symptom on top of that. As I was mourning and upset with God, I heard God speak. He asked me why I was upset. I didn't have to mourn a lost life. 
a life lost. I was still alive and my body was cleared out and ready for more children. It was in that moment that my faith was tested and sanctified. I grew deeply with the Lord. All right, back to their video. That he's talking about is Be Fruitful, Multiply by yeah. Nancy Campbell. That book has changed a lot of people's lives, um, a lot of people's opinions. It helped me just be confirmation for what God was already speaking to me through the Bible. But what the book is, it, it just is, it's not necessarily an opinion. It is what the Bible says about um, family planning. It also is the history of birth control. Those are all, they're all true things that do change people's minds. But Thank in you. his case, he right. wanted to hear directly from right. God, which the book is, it's just like putting the Bible as the topic of that in but whatever. If for him, he didn't need the book. He just needed God's word. He needed God to speak to him. And that's but there that are other else. people that have been changed by this book. So if you're interested yeah, in a I... book or more information, like what does the Bible say? What is the history of birth control? That is a good book to reference. Yeah, and I'm not discounting the book. I love Nancy, by the way. We, we've met Nancy and her husband, Colin, and we love those guys. And they do a phenomenal job. Great ministry that they have going on. And um, so I don't want to discount that the book is for, if it's for you, it's for you. Um, but for me at that point and, and where I was in my life, it wasn't about handing me a book. Um, it was just, I, I am, I am faithful enough that, that if I know that I'm wrong, I'm going to ask God, where am I wrong at? Um, and that's what I needed to do. I needed a heart check, um, to make sure that I wasn't leaning into my own selfish desires, um, in, in a way to where. I miss his blessing um, because if I, if I fast forward to where I am now, that was four, that was the fourth kid I'm talking um, and we're having this conversation and this struggle and I'm teeing in now. And so I have six blessings that because I listened to God and I did it his way that now I get to enjoy life with six more beautiful babies. So why shouldn't we prevent children? Why shouldn't we? Well, I mean, it's a it, it, honestly, it's it be it really comes down to it become it's a lack of trust. I mean, that's that's really it in a nutshell. Like, I mean, I, I don't know what you're expecting to get out of this answer, but it's pretty simple. I mean, when you say why shouldn't we? Why? I mean, dude, it's either you trust God or you don't. That's it. I mean, honestly, when we first, like you said, our story dates back to when we sat in church and we walked out of church and we said, man, how is it? that we trust God in every area except for this one. I felt like a hypocrite. How could I go out and tell people to trust God, trust God, trust God, but I got things in my pocket that I won't even show, right? Because I don't trust God in his earth. But I'm going to show you these, right? Because, oh, man, I trust him in my finances. I trust him in my health. I trust him, like all this, but there are pockets that we have that will never unfold to somebody else, right? Um, and, and honestly, we're just hypocrites. And we're going to be Christians that are truly ready to lay our life down and to say, God, here I am. I don't want to give you just 90%. I want to give you all of me. So if I'm saying I trust you, the Bible says lean not on your own understanding, right? But acknowledge him in all your ways. And, and so when you lean into that and you trust him with all your heart, Man, it says all and all. Okay, so divorcing the context of this conversation, I do kind of appreciate the awareness of saying like, I felt like a hypocrite because I'll show you all these things, but I've got this one thing in my back pocket that we're not going to talk about because I do think that that's kind of an issue in uh, a lot of religious spaces. It's like we have these certain sins or issues or struggles that are like the socially acceptable ones that we feel comfortable sharing but then there are those deeper struggles or those darker things or that thing where you're like ah, this one's not coming out like this one's not going to be shared publicly because this one's mine it's not the socially acceptable one and again I know that that's not what they are talking about but I like talking about that concept I like talking about those things where there are certain acceptable sins in the church that people will say, people will be like, oh, I'm a sinner. You know, sometimes I struggle with harsh words towards my wife or I'm impatient. You know, it's the relatable pastor thing. Like, you know what? Sometimes I just get frustrated and I yell at my kids because they're like, oh, he sins too. But then you don't really get like the deep, dark thing where it's like, oh, 
that's a real human thing that you're struggling with that that we should talk about that would really enrich our faith so I just wanted to point that out you know I I appreciate that in this context though he's saying like I felt like a hypocrite because I was saying one thing but there was something that I was withholding faith in even if I don't agree with um, the concept of preventing pregnancy being a sin all in Hebrew any type of version you want to look at is always going to be all Okay, so what was the hardest thing for you to surrender when you made that decision? It was, it was, uh, the hardest was, was my will. It, right. it was, it was a will. I had to lay down mine in order to take up his. And so it was about my, it, you know, and early on, right, I had a plan for three. And I forget, you tell me that you didn't want a lot, but I, I remember a lot that you really wanted kids, that is. Um, but the reality is, is that, man, it's, it's so much that you feel like you have to sacrifice, which you do, right? You got to, sometimes you got to sacrifice big moves that you want to make. Um, but you know what? It's nothing, everything about following Christ comes with the sacrifice. And so the question becomes, are you willing to make a sacrifice um, for what it is that he truly has in store for you? So when I ask that, like specifically, a lot of people say, I don't, I don't have enough time to stay with my kids. I don't, I am afraid yeah. I don't, I, I can't provide for them. The world is too scary. I don't want to bring kids into this world. Like what out of those things was your biggest, yeah. like, hardest thing for you to be like, mm, that scares me or that's my, yeah. you know, what was your biggest fear? And I think it? one of the things we talked about for sure is the ability to spend time with all of them, right? Um, I know we talked about that a lot. It's just, man, how are we going to make time for, for all of them, like individually? Uh, you'll be able to do that together as a family. That's easy. Um, but to be able to really spend time with each and every one of them so that they, one, know that you you love them, they feel loved, um, but two, they, they, that they get the attention that they need. Um, and so we've been able to overcome that simply by making time. And I think that's the most important thing. Um, it's not about, man, how do I how do I do this? How do I? It's about being intentional about it. You got to make time for it. Um, so we make time for those one on one dates with our with our daughters or our sons and mommy goes and dad goes. And um, that way they can actually vocalize, you know, what it is that they're going through, internalize it as well. Um, but but see mom and dad even as sounding boards without having to talk so much and just listen. Uh, there's so much to learn from each and every one of them. If we don't take that time individually, we'll end up missing out on on um, growing ourselves. And so. Um, I, 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 that was definitely something that was a struggle for me uh, when it came to having more kids, but we've been able to overcome that by simply being intentional and making time. Um, the other thing was, um, okay, before he gets into the other thing, I do think that's a valid concern when you have 10 children, how do you make sure that you are making time for each of those children individually to like grow your relationship with them and to understand if they're struggling with something or where they're at or, you know, just have quality time with your kids individually because they are individual people. They are their own people. They are not the collective Collins kids. Like they are each their own person, even though they're part of the same family. And I think it's also important to consider if I have this many kids, how do I take care of them as a parent without parentifying my other children, without making my older children take on responsibilities and roles that they should not have to at a young age. Because that's like, that's something that really tends to happen, especially with older daughters in quiverful families or very large families is they're expected to take on roles of, of the role of being caretakers for their younger siblings when they shouldn't have to. I mean, yeah, like, as an older sibling, if your parents ask you to babysit or like help with chores, you know, even the younger kids, obviously helping out with chores, doing stuff around the house, like those are normal things to do. But we often see it taken to more extremes in large families like this simply because as a mom and a dad, as two people, there's no way you are going to have enough time to do all of those things for all of your children of cooking, cleaning, homework, child care, like all this stuff. You're not going to be able to take on all that responsibility, just the two of you. You need help. And they often don't get like nannies or babysitters involved or, or housekeepers involved to take care of the home so you can focus on the kids, right? It goes to the older children. And I personally don't think that that's fair because every kid deserves to have a childhood. The It, it was the, I'm just going to go there. It's, it's really the the fear of 
not being loved by my wife, right? So she would have mm. all of these other children that she would have to care for that I would not receive attention, right? Oh. Or I would not feel as loved because somebody else is taking her time. Um, but there is something to say about that because I was able to overcome that simply by when I when the children are born and I see everything that you go through, um, it really does, it does something to me as a man because I see the strength for one that you have and two, the love that you have um, for our children. And so it's like in my mind, I'm like, why, why wouldn't I want my children to have that, right? Even constantly. And if that means taken away from me, again, it comes with a sacrifice. So that means if I have to not be around my wife to where we can hug or, or kindle or whatever, right? Um, and, and that the children are getting that, that's a sacrifice I'm worth that's, that's worth having all day. Um, that's a sweet compliment to give your wife. Because we'll all, again, we're intentional about making time now where we, we weren't that good early on. Um, we didn't make time for date nights. We didn't make time for um, uh, one-on-ones and just prayer time. We didn't do that. But we, again, have made time to do those things. So now both needs are being met, um, mine and the children. So She wants in. Um, you want to come sit with hold us? Hold on, let me let her in. Like your tears. Okay, so regarding time, I just I had a few things I wanted to add. Um, we're intentional. I think that we actually spend more time because we're more intentional and we have to do that. But homeschooling, like we don't send our kids off to school, so we have all of that time. We pastor a home church and our kids sit in church with us. So we have all of that time. Um, he coaches them and trains them uh, three days a week. Mm -hmm. So he has all of that time with them. And I had another one. And Sundays, we do church at home. And so we have like a two hours on Sundays that we spend all of that time with them. So we have, we are more intentional. And I think the more kids you have, the more you have to be more intentional. And so I, the crazy thing is a family of two kids, I feel like do not spend as much time with their children as we do with 10 kids because we are intentional about that because that was one of our two thoughts. First, I knew she, I knew that she homeschooled her children, but thinking about the logistics of let's say they start homeschooling for like kindergarten kindergarten through your oldest child who is 13 years old right now that's such a wide variety i don't know how effective that is to homeschool kid that many kids with that wide of a range in ages that just seems like things probably aren't going to be taught as in depth and like skills aren't going to be um as well developed as they should be in terms of their schooling. That's just a concern that I would have if I were in a position to be homeschooling 10 children. And then secondly, she says that she feels like they spend more time with their kids than a family of four does, a family with two parents and two children. And it's because they're intentional. But I think it's because you have to be intentional. Like I'm thinking about what her perception is of how families of four spend their time. And she's probably thinking, well, both parents work and the kids go to daycare and the kids go to baseball or swim lessons or gymnastics or dance or what, you know, whatever it may be, they have music lessons. And so they do all that stuff outside of the house. They don't spend time with their kids. They're not, you know, they're not doing a home church. They're not homeschooling. So we spend more time with our kids than you guys even would. But what are you going to do? You're going to put 10 kids in swim lessons. You're going to pay for that when you have to be a stay at home mom. And so you are living on a single income. No, that's, that's just realistically not going to happen. And I'm not trying to be judgmental, but l let's be realistic about this here. She's most likely judging both parents for working and having their children in daycare because they don't get to spend as much time with their kids because they're in daycare and because they're working. But in all likelihood, these parents are working one out of 
you know, financial necessity to have two incomes because sometimes even if daycare is expensive, you do have more financial freedom if both parents are working. But there are also scenarios where both parents work because both parents want to work because they like their careers and they like what they do and they find that fulfilling. And then, hey, if they have that extra money to put their kids in activities that will enrich them, then they go ahead and do that because that's what's valuable to them. And that's how they choose to spend their time Uh, in relation to their children. So like her making it a point to say, well, we spend more time with our kids because we have more kids. And so we're more intentional about it. Doesn't really land for me. Our fears. And I think that our intimacy has not been hindered at all. People always ask, how are you guys intimate with 10 children? Well, clearly we don't have a problem. We have 10 children. Um, but yeah, we do like take extra date nights. You kind of like need alone time when you have lots got of kids. To, so. you got to. Yeah. So you are kind of more intentional with that. Okay. Um, what, what, oh, I think we already answered that. What does God's word say about it? It's simply trusting. I, I, I haven't read anything where it says not to. Um, I mean, it's a six years in. Well, we read the Bible straight through in six years. I I just can't find anything in the scripture that, that tells you, one, lean on your own understanding, right? And if he truly is, which he is, um, the, the creator of all, and and that um, he opens and closes the womb, like, where, where would we come into play? He never asked for our advice at all in this area. So I, I just don't see it. I don't see it. And a lot of people... You know, including myself, I used to try to, my answer always was just use common sense and common sense and common sense. And um, and I think at the end of the day, we can always try to find a way to excuse our way out using the term common sense. Uh, but what's common to us is not common to God. And I think that's what people need to understand. His thoughts are not our thoughts. His ways are not our ways. And so when we can simply understand the mind of Christ, and that is to to give life and life abundantly, and that he wants nothing more than to raise up soldiers in this land, in the land of the living, um, for his scene, um, to go against the adversaries, like, it would be foolish for us to sit here and be like, "Mm -mm, sorry, God, I'm not interested in that anymore to your squad, right? And we don't, I told Carissa a long time ago, is that we don't necessarily look at our children as children, as our children necessarily, right? Like we we don't borrow time. Um, and, and not only are we on borrowed time, but the reality is that we're called to be stewards of what it is that he's given us. So um, for the children that he's given us, each and every one of these arrows is, is simple for us, is that we're going to do our best with God, God's word to train them up in the way that they should go so that when they grow, they won't depart from it. And they will be like arrows in the hands of a mighty warrior. And when they're ready to be launched out, they'll be able to land anywhere in this world and make an impact for his kingdom. And that speaks more about glorifying God than it ever will us. So that's that's my thought. So how do you do it financially? How do I do it financially? (laughs) This is this is always a a good question because I used to try to do it financially. Um, And and it the the numbers were really weird. Right. At the point where I lost my job. A while back, and Carissa had um, uh, she she had made the decision to to come home and be with her children. Was that the same? That was all happening at the same time. And so, uh, while I used to track numbers, we had two homes and two cars and four kids, and and uh, and no jobs. Um, and for two months that went by, nothing ever made sense. I stopped doing finances and all this budgeting stuff at that point because the the money coming in didn't make sense in terms of how everything continued to get paid for. Um, And so the only thing that I could ever credit, ever credit it to um, is just simply God's provision. And and we can't outgive God. We can't outdo God in any area whatsoever, no matter what we try. And, um, and so even the most financial savvy people can be thrown off by God's provision. And so that that's, that's who I, I, I was at that point. I was this very financial um, driven guy. But now that I have seen God's giving every child that we get, it's like another opportunity just lands in our laps um, to say, this is what I'm doing. I'm doing a new thing. Not only am I giving you another uh, life 
but I'm, I'm going to give you ways to provide for them. I'm going to put people in your life and in your corner to help support you that you've never even known or even thought about. And, and, and But again, that's that's God's resources. And when we trust God, we get to tap into his resources, which are totally endless. And so we're just, um, we're excited, man. And, and so from a financial standpoint, I don't, I don't think about that. I don't, I don't plan. I don't plan to have children around finances. That's what I used to do. Right. But now I know that I can have them and it may not look like enough as long as I'm trusting God in this area. And if he so chooses to bless us with another one, I know the provision is coming right behind it. I'm not worried about finances whatsoever. Okay. So he's saying, you know, God provides. I don't worry about the finances because, you know, for every kid we've had, another door was open, whatever. Sure. But it's not like money just shows up in your bank account unexplainably. It's not like somebody just says, oh, well, you don't have to pay this bill anymore. I don't know exactly what they do to earn money. I mean, I know Carissa has multiple businesses. I know that he has multiple businesses. So there's money coming in that way. But he's talking about, um, you know, God's provisions or somebody coming into your life or being in your corner or whatever. And if we want to go from a, a spiritual kind of trickle down, if we want to take that concept and run with it, God's going to provide. He's going to put people in your life who will help provide. And who will get you the things that you need. But then you also, if this is the line of thinking that you're going with, you have to consider that the people that God is calling to help with the provisions need to be aligned with him as well. Like need to follow through on his will. You know, it, like I said, it's not just money showing up in your bank account out of nowhere. It's you meeting up with Shaq, him realizing that your 12 passenger van doesn't have air conditioning and deciding to be generous and get you that 15 passenger van that he got you. So it, it, it's not anti-God to be aware of your finances, to be cognizant of those and to be good stewards of your money. Because the Bible also tells us to do that. The Bible tells us to be good stewards of our money, to be responsible and to be conscious and aware of that and the debts that we have to others. So again, it's not anti-God or anti-Bible or heretical to be concerned about your finances and to plan accordingly. Is there anything that you would change? No. I tell people all the time, man, being a father of 10 beautiful children, I wouldn't change it for the world. Um, these guys have groomed me to becoming a better man, a better better father in every area. And every single one of these little arrows that comes into this house, they have a uniqueness about them that is going to strike daddy in a certain way to where my iron will be sharpened. Um, and it makes us better in terms of how we should be acting in front of our children and how we should be responding and, and, um, and those kind of things so that they can see the love of Christ in us first and foremost, so we can become better, uh, examples for our children. So man, no, it's, it's nothing better. Nothing better. What is the hardest part about having 10 kids? The hardest part. Or in... a big family in general. Jeez. Um, I mean, you, you got crying, you got the crying that's going on, right? I mean, you, you, that just comes with the territory. I mean, you got 10 more miles that are, that are, that might be angry at any given moment. Um, so, so you have that, that you're dealing with, right? Um, she's, I, I don't know. I used to really sit on the fact that, man, it's like, like going places can be tough, right? Um, cause just kind of moving yeah. everybody around can kind of be a chore sometimes just making sure that you're keeping up with them. Um, but I think that we've kind of been able to overcome some of that too, even with this little buddy system where everybody's kind of responsible for one another, which they love to do. So that's not an issue. Um, but, but that has, we have been able to raise up leaders in the house um, to where they kind of look for that. Um, so I think those kind of were the two obstacles early on was like, man, being able to kind of round everybody up and handle all these emotions at once. But, I think that we've been able to kind of uh, manage that. See, so that's a small glimpse into parentification of older children. And then also, I was just thinking about this. When he was saying, you know, 10 mouths that might be angry at any given reason, like all the noise, all that stuff, that would, for some people, I would imagine, be incredibly overstimulating and very stressful. Because not even if, if kids are angry, like it's, let's say they're all in a good mood, but they're loud. 
and they're all going off at once and just the noise and the, and the feedback that you are getting at any given time, not only for an adult, but for a child to be that stimulated all the time and to really, I don't know what, what their house looks like, how many of them share rooms. I would assume that most of them share rooms and I shared a room as a kid, like that's not a big deal, but there were four of myself and my siblings. And it still sometimes felt like I just want a second alone. And so I can only imagine with 10 children, how hard it is to get that alone time to be quiet and to reset. Ooh, that like that thought just like popped into my head of how tough that would be not only for parents, but for the kids as well. Pretty well. All right, last question. What advice do you have for men that are struggling to trust God in this area? Man, I, I'm going to tell you first and foremost, before I'm not going to come out and be like, bro, just, just trust God, right? Because you may not be there. I'm just going to be honest with you. You ain't going to be there the same way that I wasn't there. Um, is, man, spend time in prayer and ask God for his heart on the matter. Ask him what he thinks about the matter. And I think that what you will find is that just about, not just about, I'm probably, I'm even going to go, I'm going to go as far as, far as to say this, 99.9% um, of the time that if it's you who don't, is not willing to have children or uh, anything or trust God in this area, it's going to be a selfish motive. It's going to be a selfish motive. Um, and, and, and I only got 99.9 .9 because I know it's those moments where you're like, no, it ain't about me. It's about my wife's health or my girl's health. Right. And you can't, that's not necessarily looked up on as a selfish thing. Right. Um, but then you got to ask yourself, what is it that God's word says about your wife's health? Right. Does he heal or does he not? Do I trust him in this area? Or do I not? Right. Or am I okay with walking through life, looking at my wife as though she has an element in a way to where maybe we don't need to trust God in this area. Right. But just see, for me, you say that just sounds crazy. Um, but now with that being said, it's going to take two. Right. Um, I know that even if I felt strongly about the fact that God's healing my wife and it's okay to have, have kids and I'm going to trust God in this area, no matter what, she still has to have that same. She has to be able to hear that from God, too. Um, it shouldn't be a one sided thing that where one person is making the, making the decision um, based on how they feel. Um, if God is clearly articulating something to you and you're very set on that, share it with your partner and pray for them. Allow God to change their heart. Do not nag. Do not go to them and say, how dare you? I can't believe you can't do this. I, I don't know how you don't see this. Like, don't do that. It is the worst. I would rather live on the rooftop of my house than in a house with a nagging wife. Um, <laughs> not only is that biblical, but that's that's pretty accurate. I, I, I'd be on the rooftop on the corner. All right. Um, so, but. I'm sorry. How he said. I would rather live on the rooftop of my house than with a nagging wife. And he pointed to Carissa like forcefully. That just caught me off guard. Okay. But honestly, man, I, I always say, man, it is a journey that you're going to have to go through and you're going to hear, you're going to have to hear from God yourself. Um, don't just allow my words to change your heart. Um, I've been there where you are, if that's you. Um, but the reality is, is that man, God's heart on the matter it just never changed. It, it never changed. No matter how many times I went back, I mean, it was like he had already told me that Mandre, like, simply trust me in this area. And it's almost like I go back to him, man, are you sure? Like, are you sure about this? Like, am I missing something? And it was like, man, I'm not changing. My answer doesn't change. Um, so if that's you and you need to go back to say, are you sure? Are you sure? Are you sure? Continue to do it. Because God's answer won't change. Um, but but that's okay, too, because that's an opportunity to be able to solidify in your heart and in your life that you will for sure know God's heart on the matter. And if we are asking, um, the, we're asking God to align our hearts to his, then your heart will be right on the matter as well. So that's my take. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you for doing this interview. I hope this was helpful. If you all have more questions or I want him to answer something else. <laughs> you paid the sign. I it's might be, be another able, episode. I might I'm be good. able to get him to do this again, but that's doubtful. I've been trying for four years. It's not. So I hope this was helpful. And um, let me know if you have any other questions. All right.
All right, thank you. You're welcome. Love y'all. I'm out. <laughs> Well, that was quite the journey. Thank you so much for sticking it out with me. That's all I have for this one. It's always difficult to uh, cover a new a new person or an, a new couple on my channel, especially if there's somebody I haven't kept up with for a very long time, because I don't always know what to expect. And I don't know all the ins and outs and all the like behind the scenes things and, and stuff like that. So um, this was just kind of like a, like I said, a, a broad background of them and I did want to react to that video but if you want me to dig further into the Collins family not like not dig into them but cover them a little bit more or talk about certain things that they have posted definitely let me know in the comment section down below if you're watching on YouTube and if you are listening to uh, the podcast on Spotify you can leave that in the Q&A section for this particular episode you can let me know there and uh, while you are doing that, if you would consider liking this video or subscribing to my channel or leaving a rating and review if you're listening to the podcast, that would be incredible. And if you have done any of those things already, thank you so much. I am so appreciative of you and I love being able to just sit here, hang out with you and talk about whatever. Thank you so much for watching. Please be kind to people and I will see you in the next one. Bye.